We're going to be looking at something, Richard, um, within the same vein as what we've been doing. Um, the work is as very recently. Um, but it's, um, it's an organisation that's been doing archaeological work across Britain um, since 2011. Um, the work has been featured on Digging for Britain with Alice Roberts. It's been featured um, on Time Team. And everyone's mobile's off, please, um, including yours, Alan, because it's really annoying me now. We're going to be looking at the work um, of Operation Nightingale. Now, if anyone's ever come across not Operation Nightingale, um, Operation Nightingale, specifically for people um, who have been in conflict situations, male or females, is for ex-service personnel, uh, is for current serving uh, personnel who want to see archaeology um, to be used as a therapeutic basis to help their rehabilitation into normal life. And as you can tell, uh, the type of characters that archaeology brings forward to you um, are completely and entirely normal, aren't they, Alan? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, this site itself, Alan, you're not allowed to answer this question because I know you're a big head. Right, anyone tell me where this is? Well, it's a Flemish playing card thing. Yes, where is it? Barry. No, it's not Barry. No, oh, don't be so silly. Barry. It's Potts. Yeah. No. <laughs> In the UK. Operation yeah. Nightingale, yes, in the UK. Yeah, yeah British Barry personnel, Wales. yeah, got Southeast Wales. Um, um ne never each shredded wheat, South East Wales, yeah. Oh. Tenby Carmarthen. No, it's not Tenby or Carmarthen. Oh for God, you lot are absolutely useless. <laughs> when Swansea. when Pat comes back in the room, she'll give us some sense. This is Kaya Wendt. Oh. Kaya Wendt. Oh. Said. Said. It's, you're close, but this is Kaya Wendt, okay? Kaya Wendt, okay? Um, Iska Silurum, it was called Iska Silurum because um, uh, the, the name Siluris was a Roman name attributed to the vast array of different tribes in the area because they couldn't pronounce the exact names. So it's an inventive title. So uh, this, is, um, this, is, this is that uh, wonderful, um, not Iska Silurum, Venta Silurum. So this itself it's been a site that Operation Nightingale have been excavating at, and this is also a site that I've excavated at as well. The archaeologist who um, used to run Operation Nightingale, um, we never used to see eye to eye, um, but mind you, nobody else ever sees eye to eye with the guy uh, either. But I'm going to give him all, his, all the credit where it's due. He's a guy by, by the name of Sergeant uh, Dermot Walsh. He's been on Time Team uh, a few occasions. Um, and he was, he was excavating a site which is slightly north of this wonderful locality. And the archaeology itself proves that you should not always um, believe what you read um, from archaeological records. The site that he eventually went on to excavating um, is a site itself that was deemed no longer in existence. So he decided to put the site somewhere else and he actually found... Uh, the best part of a Roman villa, which still existed. So the work has been going on from 2011 up until this present point in time. And there's another archaeologist that I am in touch with, a chap by the name of Richard Osgood, um, who's very much a specialist into this area of rehabilitation. So what we're going to do, as Lynn is in the room, I'm going to try my best to make sure that technology works right, because whenever Lynn's in the room, things always go awry. And by the way, Lynn, if you don't put up with my criticism, you will not get this bottle of grog in front of me. I didn't think you were. Because you're desperate for it, aren't you? Uh, right, so you going to go. If I move this on you, I'm just trying to do a bit of multi doo It will work. Right, okay. It's, it's getting there so far. So if I get that up there, is, is it working so far? There are. It should work. Oh. Two screens. I can see on here. And you can't see. Yeah. yeah. Right. So um, there, there's been a lot written in the media. Uh, media, And over the, over the years, um, Operation Nightingale has been mentioned a few times. Uh, with excavations involving Anglo-Saxon sites. Not the one you've been mentioning. But a very similar site, Chris. Um, and, um, and lots of the work has obviously been on Roman sites as well. And prehistoric sites. So, what we're going to do, we're going to show you another image um, straight away. So, we will be coming back to Kaiwen, but at this minute, we go back and forth 
to a site on Salisbury Plain. So this itself, a so, um, soldiers find a skeleton of a Saxon warrior on Salisbury Plain. Now they've been working at this site on Salisbury Plain uh, for at least five years. And, they, and the one thing that can be said and must be said about the work of Operation Nightingale is they've got access um, and the Ministry of Defence own 1% of the British landmass, which doesn't sound a lot, um, but when you put it down to how much the military have got control of, um, it's quite a large area. So we're talking about the Brecon Beacons, we're talking about Salisbury Plain, we're talking about West Wales, we're talking about place like, places like Catterick, which I've um, also been to, uh, um, and parts of Scotland as well. And now that landscape is a massive, diverse landscape. You've got Pictish archaeology, you've got really early prehistoric archaeology, you've got medieval archaeology, you've got Roman archaeology, Anglo-Saxon archaeology, Viking archaeology, it's all there. And the uh, one thing I would say is that when you look at organisations like this, like any government body, like uh, Pembrokeshire um, County uh, Park, and you've got Brecon as well, and one or two um, councils in Wales still have a county archaeologist that actually work for the council, not externally. Lots of um, government offices in, in um, England have a county archaeologist, and they, they are to monitor the archaeology on the land that these, th these councils own. And um, they're, they're actually in full-time employment for archaeologists working for the MOD. They work for the MOD to monitor the archaeology. You could think that um, archaeology being found on a, a, a within a military landscape um, is a, a, a fore, forbidder of doom, but lots of the archaeology within Ministry of Defence land is extremely well preserved, as we will demonstrate today. So Afghanistan war veteran um, helping out with archaeological dig military ground. So what we need to do is if we move in, because I know before Chris actually even says anything, <coughs> right, she say, oh, I can't see that. I know Chris, OK? I'm getting it. Yeah. So we've got a, um, a spear there and we've got a sword. Mm. And I think it's a little bit of a dagger here. Really good, uh, really good set of human remains. And this was actually found on the last day of excavation when they were excavating this on one of their seasons. Usually on an archaeological excavation, something's found on the last day that's far better than anything found over the past five weeks, three weeks, or whatever. So that's always what happens on an archaeological excavation. And usually, in the case of the site at Kaiwent, the archaeology that they were looking for was actually under the spoil heap that the antiquarians put there in the Victorian period. And what used to happen on Time Team? It's under the spoil heap. More or less every single time. So, um, but there's, there's, there's lots of things that can be said about um, having military veterans involved within the archaeology. It's not only sort of getting them back into civilian life, you know, anything can really do that. They can go outward bound course, you know what I mean? But um, what the, the, way, the way this is doing this is actually connecting themselves with, with actual people. Um, it's actually bringing them down to earth. Believe me, um, so Shane Dennis isn't in the room. Uh, I had him working on um, some sets of human remains um, on a set of human remains on Tuesday. And um, we just don't speak to each other when he's in the studio. And the same with Richard in, in, in Barry as well. When they're working on human remains, nobody speaks to each other. It's almost as if you can hear a pin drop in the room. It's almost as if that connection with somebody from the past uh, is, is, very, um, is very direct. There's a direct connection when you're holding um, somebody's limbs um, or somebody's teeth or a bit of jawbone and so on. Um, and this, this connection with, they, they, lot, they're saying that lots of these veterans have had um, severe traumas and, and this isn't to insult any veterans, they become very selfish and introspective. They, they just think about themselves. I'm only going by my notes and it's actually true. Because when people, have, when people have had extreme traumas, the only thing they can think about is that trauma. Uh, and and I, I, can, I can say about that from experience. You just think about that thing that's going on for you. Nothing else matters. And when you've got a veteran like that who's, who's, who's suffered uh, in, in various conflicts, um, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and so on, and even the Falkland Islands, um, what you need to do, you need to get them out of that experience. The only, the only way to get them into life, everyday life, uh, is to get other people around who've had like-minded experiences. And this is what the archaeology is doing. Strangely enough, Jim, quickly. Oh, just quickly, uh, this was the Mental Health Week in late 1971 in the Benton Village Church. 
and um, kept on running all the streets and people could talk about their experiences and things. And this, this, is, this is that direct thing. The yeah. People in the military, yeah, that, that, that's good, you've used that. Pe people in the military um, find it very difficult with, with activities like that because they've had very difficult, different experiences. And they've got to see this type of experience as bringing them out of themselves. And actually, some of these individuals have actually gone on to um, having full-blown careers in archaeology. So that's brilliant as well. So let's carry on. So, um, oh, that's my notes. You don't want to read that. Let's get you another image. As you can see, there's lots of notes here today. I'm trying to get another image. Hang on. There we go. And these, these are actually ser serving, serving soldiers. Uh, so, this, so this article, we, we mentioned about the soldiers on, on Salisbury Plain and, and the bones that we've just seen on the last day of an excavation by soldiers within the military training lands on Salisbury Plain. <coughs> finding that set of human remains with, with the sword and, and with the spearhead um, is, a, is a direct connection with, the, with, with their own worldly lives within the military. Um, and actually, to be honest with you, I think I moved on from that image too soon, so I'm going to get it back. Um, so here we go. Let's just go back. So this connects with what I'm talking about. Okay. There it is again. There it is. Um, I know, I know um, Lynn was about to say, let's just have that image back. So I'm going to... Sorry, Lynn. But I won't pick on you anymore, Lynn, for a few minutes. There'll be a change. So it's a, a brother, uh, a comrade in arms, comrade in arms. It's somebody that they can relate to. They're there in the ground, and it's somebody that they can directly relate to. You know, they, they've, they've seen people die in the field. They've had to deal with people dying in the field. Like police officers have had to, like ambulance drivers and so on. These, these, are, these are innate traumas. Um, and and the, the, the respect, they're describing the type of respect that each of these soldiers give to somebody that's buried in the ground um, is, is as remarkable as I'm describing when we're working on human remains and we're, we're, we're trying to process them. Um, and working alongside um, this set of human remains, that they found a, a lovely belt buckle, Anglo-Saxon belt buckle, as um, Chris was talking about earlier on with another site, um, a knife, um, you've got a knife here, you, they found tweezers, um, and they found, they found this array of human remains alongside an array of another 74 sets of human remains and um, a site that goes back to the Neolithic period as well, directly under the landscape that they're actually um, using military vehicles and tanks at. So, there, there's, so they're talking about these tanks have been trundling across the landscape and these human remains are basically inches below the surface and... You've got a complete skull. And why are they working there? The, one, the wonderful thing with the military Ministry of Defence um, is that you've got manpower. Um, there's a small amount of public money available for the archaeological work. You've got manpower. You can use it for rehabilitation. So you can take that budget. You can draw that down. And then the archaeology that's not being excavated can be excavated, it can't really be excavated because it's on the <coughs> Ministry of Defence land. But there's a certain threat <coughs> to the archaeology, um, and it's not a human threat because tanks are being trundling across this. So, why do they need to excavate it? That's not doing any damage. What is going to be the threat to this? It's not a metal detecting enthusiast either. Can't get on Ministry of Defence land. That's, that's, there's an interesting thing there metal detect enthusiast using a metal detector, which was originally devised before the Second World War uh, as a mine detecting piece of equipment. So now it's got civilian use. Strangely enough, archaeologists have been then used to use their skills to have a military use, like geophysical survey and so on. So you can find the likes of um, Saddam Hussein in Iraq by using geophysical surveying equipment and so on. So that's not how he was found, but you know, there's all these interactions. So there's lots of interactions between the archaeologist uh, and, for example, somebody in the military. It was, and here we go, it was a classic last day of the excavation. There was a buzz across the site. The soldier definitely had a sense of kinship 
um, states Richard Osgood, the other archaeologist that I mentioned. Um, and then, and then we've got then we've got the fact that um, there are other resources involved, and what the Ministry of Defence have been working alongside they've been working alongside various museums uh, and Wessex Archaeology, which is also featured extensively on Time Team. So the site they're actually finding these sets of remains is a site known as Barrow Clump, uh, and has a remarkably long history of human activity. And nobody's asked me what is the perceived threat, which I'll come on to. Ellen was just about to ask that. The Bronze Age burial mound built on an even older Neolithic settlement was re then reused as an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. So in other words, people in the Anglo-Saxon period deemed a certain part of the landscape as being sacred, and they decided to bury their loved ones at a site that people had been buried at for thousands of years. It had already been damaged by ploughing years and years ago. But the true instigator of damage to the site was a very large mammal known as a badger, which was burying, burrowing out the entire site and kicking out human bones as they dug. Now, the wonderful thing, folks, is that a few years ago, um, I was wandering in the bushes with a, with a guy from, from Sully. <laughs> Barbara was there in her bag, so I can't be accused of anything. He was wandering through the bushes, um, and he said, he said, where are we actually wandering today? I wanted to come with you guys today. Because when I was a child, I used to wander through these woods, and there was a badger set. And the badger um, that, that we came across, we looked down into his burrow, we could actually see a mosaic floor, right? And I, I was intrigued by this. And I thought, as I wandered off, I thought, oh, another load of crap that I'm hearing from a member of the public. But then, then I then realised, then I then realised that he may have a point. Because a set of nine relatives um, down at Ford Farm um, in the Vale of Gamorgan, said to me that um, sometime in the 1950s, when they were up there amongst the tree line, they were looking into a badger set, and guess what they saw? A paved, not a mosaic, but a paved area, actually within the badger set. Unless badgers are making mosaics or <laughs> paved <laughs> areas, okay, folks? Possible. You know? Yeah, I know it's possible, right? But wind in the willows isn't real, okay? Oh. Oh, God, for that. I, I have shattered your dreams, exactly. You can't go out in the car that goes, beep, beep. Anyway, the badgers have, uh, so they didn't, so what they did, they excavated the site, right? Um, and after they finished the excavations, they moved, the badgers are now happily back in residence in the barrow. Good. So they moved them back in. Good. It's great. But they only had a limited time to do that. Otherwise, the badgers would have got really upset and moved else, mm -hmm. elsewhere. So, um, so this, this, was a, this was an excavation that had been going on since 2014. It has actually been going on this year. And then what they do, they do a month's worth of excavation at the site. Um, and they're finding lots of individuals, mainly men, but a score of women and a small number of children. And the men seem to be... Um, you, you mentioned something similar to this, but there's a different side. So you've got the barrow, and then what you've got, the Bronze Age barrow, and then the, the, the um, Anglo-Saxon burials from 1,500 years ago arranged around the outside, and the women arranged closer towards the centre of barrow. So the barrow was already there, but what's happening is the, uh, is the women and children are buried more towards the centre. So they've got all those grave goods, weapons, and jewellery. Um, and they've got, um, they found the remains of a little girl buried with a large amber bead. One of the graves mm. held a young boy curled, um, buried curled as if in sleep. Um, one of the few without any grave goods. And I, I do believe we've got one slide of this where, where the, um, the legs are so kicked in. Um, it's, it's quite a quite a quaint image. I'm not exactly sure we've got that. So the splendidly armed soldier um, was actually found within the last minutes of the excavation that day by somebody doing a last sweep over the site using a metal detector. Um, but 
That's what they used to be using in Time Team and so on. So we found one grave directly below the track, and that's the one we've mentioned. And it's reassuring that it's not the military damage in the archaeology, but in fact it's those damnable badges. And do you know what, Alan? Yeah. Alan? One of the best finds I ever found. Do you know, you know when you go to Kyrwent and you've got that mound in the corner, yeah, yeah, man? yeah? Well, when I was a child, right, I thought, right, I want a piece of, find this piece of Roman Samian bowl, right? I was uh, looking along, right, and kicking the mole hills, and guess what I found? A mole. <laughs> <laughs> no, a bit of Samian oh. bowl! <laughs> God's sake! I can't get a staff anymore. Right, a wonderful bit of semen bowl, and it was there. So it's those moles and it's those badgers and those rabbits and all those little critters that identify archaeological sites. Um, they and and in a way they had to excavate there. They had to excavate there before the damage is lost, before the site is lost forever. So let's go. Let's go back into this. Um, and I, I'm glad nobody's fallen asleep in this lecture so far. I did have a comment that somebody did fall asleep in my lecture on Tuesday. So he was pissed. Because it's warm. Well, okay, then ask Kathy to open, open the window. window. Are you all warm? No. Well, stuff you. Nobody cares about you. Take your jumper off. Exactly. Uh, he hasn't got anything underneath it. Oh, okay. He's got a bra, but he loaned that off me. Operation Nightingale, an initiative to assist the recovery of wounded, injured and sick military personnel and veterans by getting them involved in archaeological investigations. Um, that's that image that I wanted to show you. Um, so back to the, back to the other slide. Angels to the rescue. Meet the men and women who are saving Britain's heritage one project at a time. Um, and amazing enough, this is working okay, so I haven't really ruptured um, Lynn's cauldron making at this minute. Um, so Operation Nightingale, established in 2011 by two archaeologists, well, by two individuals, one known as um, uh, Richard Osgood um, and a military man known as Sergeant Dermot Walsh, who I do believe you will have seen on a couple of occasions on Time Team. And it was basically... Um, it was basically over a conversation these two individuals met and they started talking about um, ways of rehabilitating the soldiers. So um, you know, a thousand plus individuals have been involved in the excavations from the different arms of the military um, and that's not a pun at all. Um, they, they, they are actually involving people with severe disability, uh, people without limbs. Yes, and the one thing they've actually been using, right? Yes, the one thing they've actually been using, they've been using um, pe people who can't see. Like, I couldn't believe this episode of Time Team. I don't know if any of you saw it. It, it, was, um, it was Tony Robinson, right? I think it was a Roman site or something. Um, I can remember a, a, a red wall and it was a bit of a field. And Tony Robinson's coming over um, and, um, and these, these guys are excavating. And they've, they've got uh, parts, bits of military uniform on they're excavating. Um, and, then, um, and then somebody turns around and said to Tony Robertson, you know these people excavating you, they're actually blind. Mm. <laughs> they were really, they were really well trained. They were actually blind. Mm. They were blind. And because I think the first thing that, I think uh, the penny dropped with Tony when, when he was seeing that they were excavating, but they were using their fingers a lot. And it, it was almost as if we, they, they got the camera in that bit and then Tony was told. Um, and and, and, and the, the touch of their fingers, uh, th they were able to understand the archaeology a lot better than other people who were alongside them. Um, I've go got for a it. quick question. When you're excavating, do you mean is this a person that goes on hold to produce... Yes, they do. Um, yeah, we, we, um, there, there, there are examples. Um, this, is, this is a very interesting one, actually. And as we, we've mentioned a bit of this today, it's your fault, uh, Chris, for mentioning in the first place humour remains. Loads of them. You did. It was a good one there. It was a good one. So, so what's happening is that um, they, they were excavating um, bodies from um, just before the outbreak of the plague. Uh, the... Um, the, the, the plague of uh, 1348, uh, 1349. Um, 
and they, they, they were excavating away and, um, and there was anthrax spores still active and live in the soil. Um, not bacteria, the spores. The spores. Yes. Yes, they will. They will. Yes. Yes. The spore, exactly. The ants. And so it becomes that there's a disease, there's a spore, or not? If it's bacteria, bacteria will move towards on the damp tissue. Moisture. There's no damp. It'll die. The oxygen will kill it. But the fact now, they they found these these spores themselves still active there. They were there, um, and. And that goes to show that masking yourself up is a very wise thing indeed. I, I don't know, I, I haven't told this. <laughs> but now, we were really being sensible there, and now, because you've, you've done that, I'm going to get really gruesome, right? Now, now th there was, there, one sec, there was back, there was back in, um, in France, um, this is going to be some time, time ago now, uh, so I started... When I, when I was told this story about 20 odd years ago, it was 20 years previous, so 40 odd years ago in France, um, there, there, was this, there was this abbey uh, near Paris, and they, they were, there was these two guys who were really curious about the abbey, right? And they had heard something about a crypt. So um, they, they decided to go there one night with several uh, pickaxes and crowbars, and they thought they had found an area where, where, where it seemed to be a void or something underground. They were tapping it and the stone seemed hollow as it would happen in most, most of these places. Anyway, lifted up this slab with a crowbar and there was these steps leading underground and they had found the crypt, right? So they thought, oh, wow, we found the crypt. This is absolutely brilliant. Um, at that moment, somebody saw them, luckily, in the graveyard, right, lifting up this stone with a crowbar. <coughs> when I say luckily... Um, it goes on to explain the rest of it. And then what happens then is that they go down downstairs and they're, they're rooting around um, and the one guy is saying to the other guy, um, I think I found a bit of wood. Um, and the other guy says, well, this bit of wood feels all spongy and um, something not quite right about it. Um, and they hadn't straight, they hadn't the other part of the story didn't actually go down with any torches, they, they were rooting around, oh. yeah. Um, and um, and long story short, um, before they could actually get up to the top of the steps with, with whatever they were holding, um, they, 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 they were armed French um policemen around, right? They said, You can't leave this because this is where they bury the plague victims. The things that they were holding were actually limbs, and it was fairly moist and all the rest of it down there. And these people, had, these two guys, had to go in isolation, um, and then um, they, they survived. But they, but afterwards, they had to burn everything down there to stop the risk of anyone else going down there, because people will be curious and they will get hold of these limbs. So if you answer your question, you be careful, you be very careful with bones. Very careful with bones. So seven hundred. What were you going to say, they something, Andrew? Something in York around. Um, I, I seem to remember a long time ago when I was there. <coughs> all under grass. Oh yeah, no, they, 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 I'm doing that one right opposite the train station. Opposite the train station, there's the cholera pits, <laughs> right? The cholera pits, and um, Kathy is the only one in the room who was actually. Were you on that trip? Nobody in this room was on that trip. So I've told this before, right? So what I said on the Sunday, right? I've got a special treat for you all, right? We're going to go and see the cholera pits, right? Now, this is a, a group of 15 individuals, highly educated, most of them. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm saying we're going to go to see these cholera pits. And they're all really, I've got them up early in the morning. We're going to see these cholera pits. Anyway, we're charging down to the train station in York. And, and, and we go around the corner. And I got really excited. And I go, and ba-ba! da -da! And everyone's going, <coughs> and one by one, right, you, one by one, I'm going, what's wrong, guys? They said, we expected to see pits. Yeah, no, these are the cholera pits. There's a sign over there saying that are cholera pits. And then some, somebody else said, yeah, but we're expecting to see holes in the ground. 
And then somebody else said, where's the bones? I can't see any bones sticking out the trench, right? And I've got to be honest with you, right, they all expected pits with bones still sticking out. Cholera, cholera pits. It's called the cholera pits. It's the name for it. So, so... It's peeled, isn't it? And it said it can't be dug up. It can't be dug up. But how silly can you get? They were, it's the most disappointment I've ever had in my life. Okay? What would you go and visit it for, though, if there's nothing there? This... Hang on, shut up, you, and you can shut up. There's a load of slabs there telling people how many people... Yeah, yeah and all the rest of it, yeah? It's a piece of history. What a boring lot of people, and you can shut up. <laughs> right, well, quickly. I was going to say, you don't have to go there to see that. And there was the cholera hospital on the um, flat and mine. Yeah. Yes, there was. Yeah. Yeah. But only one person was interred at the cholera hospital on flat home. And then... That they had to build a little furnace on, on, on flat home and they had to burn that one body. Um, so here we go, 700, 770 um, scheduled monuments uh, within the portfolio of the Ministry of De Defence with the 1% of the UK uh, mainland that they actually possess. They've got four archaeologists working for them. Fabulous opportunities to be able to understand this landscape Operation Nightingale has also worked alongside several military-related charities to rehabilitate people, which is great. And the artefacts are out there for all to see. Applying to participate? Anyone served in the military? Anyone a military veteran? Well, you can all kiss goodbye to getting involved in this. Um, you, you can't get involved unless you're a veteran or a serving um, uh, personnel, and you can't get involved is specifically for the Ministry of Defence, and also it's with their insurance and all the rest of it. And they've, um, they've got something... No, pardon? How have hey? you been there? How did you do? I haven't been involved. I've been involved in my excavations. Of I went, but not with this. They, they, they've um, got what's called the Defence Archaeology Group uh, that does all this work for Operation Nightingale. And the president is a certain guy who none of you will know is uh, Phil Hardy. Mm. Time team, yes. He's there. Oh, I've never known a night like it. Um, so, and, and they've actually got a really good, intriguing website. So, just just a little bit of information. Um, um, this is quite a bold statement to make about archaeology. I'm not, it's not one of these guys, but for me, getting involved in heritage was a lifesaver, says Richard Bennett, a former Royal Marines troop sergeant who was forced to leave the military in 2011 due to spinal injuries suffered in Afghanistan. On returning to civilian life, um, Sergeant uh, Bennett <laughs> expected to work in security, the traditional port of call for veterans. However, a trip to an archaeological excavation op arranged by Operation Nightingale, a project that aims to get veterans um, involved with heritage um, back into normal life, he says... I took my daughter to Salisbury Plain, where we excavated an Anglo-Saxon cemetery on a prehistoric building uh, mound. And we recovered, uh, it's saying 74 skeletons. Um, and he was actually there when they found that sword and copious amounts of jewellery and fear. But they're still excavating there today. So the excavations have, have continued on. And he's gone on. There's hope for you all yet, yeah, Alan. Um, he's gone on to um, sit a degree in archaeology with the University of Essex. Um, which he's now got, um, and he's been involved with various excavations, the Salisbury Plain near Stonehenge, various burial mounds, and may sound strange to some of you in the room, uh, a crash site of a Second World War Spitfire. Did you know that every single plane that has crashed in Wales has now been found and recovered, and all the bodies recovered in Wales, but they're still finding a number across England? Um, and this is, this is a winning combination of being outdoors, getting hands-on, and seeing things that have not been touched for thousands of years. And it ties in the camaraderie of the whole military ethos. A lot of people on our project have been out of the military environment for a couple of years. So it's all about getting them back into camaraderie. And this is really important. So the place that we're going to... Um, what we're going to do, I do believe... Um, we're going to look at Barrow Club for a little bit. Probably, probably do half and half. So let's just get this image in. These two lads. Now, we're not going to show the thighs to um, Cathy because she'll get, to get, get really excited. She likes soldier boys. I, I, I'm picking on you now, Cathy. Lynn's having that. Right, so you... Oh, actually, I'll show you... Oh, hang on. Before anyone, before Ellen has her fourth width, right, where exactly is this excavation? 
right? Um, um, that silly place, Stonehenge, um, and there's the excavations on Salisbury Plain. There, okay. So Amesbury, Andover, um, Pusey Horse. Um, down there is the sea. Over there's Cornwall, and over there's London. Are you satisfied, Ellen? Thank God for that. You know, I, I'm glad I've satisfied Ellen for once. She's a very difficult woman to satisfy. By, by the way, Alan, we're going up to Trellick on Sunday. <laughs> You're welcome to join us, Alan. Let's throw something at you. <laughs> so here we go. Operation Nightingale, the excavations on the Salisbury Plain. Um, a bit of detail that we, we haven't already mentioned. The, the, site, the archaeology that they've, they've been working on it, um, on Salisbury Plain, and I'm sure the one that uh, Lynn mentioned earlier on, the archaeology is extremely well preserved. Um, and they've been working alongside Wessex archaeology, and it's it's that major threat of the badgers, um, and it's that's one of the things that I always say to people that when they're out and about and they see molehills, give them a good old kick, because you never know what you might find. Okay, you never know what you might find. Um, I've got a little video. Um, um, I'm sure most of my children have got mental health problems. But, um, my, 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 my daughter, Kerry Ann, right, um, I made a little film of her one day and I said, right, kick the molehills, look in them. And she was doing this. She got so excited. We, she did about 100 molehills in Abergavenny. She was kicking them and saying, no artifacts. There were no artifacts in them. But molehills can, can give that information to what's going on underneath the surface, like that piece of Roman Samian where Alan's really jealous now, he never found it himself. Mm. Um, um, that piece of Roman Samian where, um, and all the rest of it, um, these have been found uh, thanks to our little friends. So this wonderful landscape, a place known as Barrow Clump, there's the excavations at Barrow Clump, and there's, there's one of the bodies being excavated. Um, and we're, we're talking about um, bodies from the 500s, again, exactly the same date you're talking about, Lynn. So I don't... Chris. Chris. <laughs> Why should she be ashamed with you called Lynn? I think I Lynn's know. a very good-looking woman, yeah. Fred. She doesn't look anything like Fred. Interchangeable, yeah. Interchangeable, yeah. yeah. They're not really excavating bodies, either. Bodies are gone. There's only skeletons or other remains left, so they're not bodies. The bodies are kind of like... Right, I, I am, I am going to take uh, power with you. There was another um, strumper on this um, woman's hour um, saying, well, um, when somebody's died, the, the, um, somebody's human remains are not, not a person anymore. And I completely disagree with that. So don't even get me started on that one. As far as I'm concerned, these human remains do exhibit a body and they still... Um, have a sense of humanity ab about them and I'm not going to go any further to that because I'm sure we're going to be upsetting a few people in the room and we'll be polarised in this room as much as remain and leave is when we talk about Brexit so we're not going there that was good so I've got all the woman's hour stuff out good, my system off your chest now good good thank you you sounded as if you were a kind caring gentleman saying that I tried to be good <laughs> for those in need those in need, exactly. I'm always in need. Continuing burrowing was bringing human bones and grave goods um, to the surface. And this site was on the Monuments at Risk register. In fact, when you think about it, um, any scheduled ancient monument, as long as it's not in the Vale of Glamorgan, is precious. Um, any scheduled um, ancient monument is scheduled because it's meant to be preserved forever and is at risk. And it's supposed to be saved for society to, to love and endure for all time. Um, and But some sites need to be investigated because you can't... Actually, um, this may sound silly, right, but they did actually put signs up around some of the monuments on Salisbury Plain warning badgers. Well, not the badgers can't read, can they're, they're, they're actually... Be safe, yeah. Stay away, Mr. Badger. Yeah. So not only can lead the museum, they can read. Yeah, 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 honestly, straight up. Straight up. Oh. Straight up. Pete, this is true. Badgers keep out. Badgers keep out. They can make mosaics. They can slab floors. What else can they do? And they can be annoying neighbours as well. So there you go. That's like those back bridges, isn't it? Why is that woman being bloody smoking? Right, okay. So, work it. Be, you two, before you get too excited, Mike, shut up. Right. 
to mention the rats, because we've had bouncers and moles, and now we're going to have rats again, aren't we? Oh. Yeah, what about Oh, you can shut up as well! What about penguins? They're going to ship down. Wind in the willows. Wind in the willows. Penguins right. are in wind of the willows, aren't they? Can we just get on? Thank you! So, I, I think, I think, I, I think, um, I, yeah, I think what I'll, what I'll do, right, just, just, ah. So, yeah. Right. If anyone if anyone wants to find out more about Barrow Clump, it's published on the website Operation Nightingale. If anyone wants to write that down. And I think the one thing I will say is that you've got a site now that's being excavated. A landscape that's been used for military use. In a way, it's a landscape that's always been used. <coughs> and I think it's very important that they're working on a set of human remains where people have been buried and interred for a very, very long time. Uh, from the Neolithic period, Bronze Age, Iron Age, all the way in through to the Anglo-Saxon period. And I think there's that sense of connectedness, a kinship. And when soldiers are working there, They've got that sense of kinship with the past as well. So actually, um, this this is um, this next this next thing. So we, we're working on these these wonderful sets of human remains um, with around the barrow itself. So what's happened? The barrow itself has been cut into by all these different remains, like a chessboard, um, and the Bronze Age archaeology is still there. They, what they've done because they're still working there now. They, they've left intact, uh, they've left intact, oh, not that silly, twonk. Um, they've left intact um, half of the, the barrow. Um, they, so far, are not included in this year, 75 sets of human remains. 30 uh, military personnel have been involved in that site, including that guy that we've mentioned. Um, the reenactors have been at work there as well. Uh, for the life of me, right? Um, so that's not you, is it? Video. No, it's not me, and you can shut up. No, and what were you going to say, Alan? Video. Click on that triangle. I'm not. No, I don't want that guy talking. I don't want him involved in this. But right. that is a reconstruction of an Anglo-Saxon warrior, honestly, right? Based on based on the stuff that they. Yeah, really. Yeah, let's just move on. I, I'm just. I, I need a break. I, I really need a break. So Operation Nightingale after the break, so what I want to do finally, we'll keep that loon on there. Um, and, um, well, it was, it was interesting on, uh, on set yesterday, we're all talking in the green room, and everyone in that room are dressed up as a woman at one point or another. <laughs> and we were talking about the dresses that we were wearing, what the underwear was like, mm. how we had our hair styled, and the women were completely aghast. <laughs> yeah. Comparing yeah. makeup, were you? Yeah, yeah. Just one question. Go for it. Is there a period after which you can use all the human bodies? Is there like a set period you say not to stuff like that? Mm -hmm. So if you take every grave stone and every shirt, you take anybody out? No, you can't yeah. dig anyone up. <laughs> they're, they're complete, uh, working on any sets of something. human remains is completely legal. You need a, you need a license from the Home Office, or you need the uh, uh, Ministry of Justice knocking on your door saying, look, you know, this is just not. You know, you, you, it, it's it's. It's an imprisonable offence, and and the, the 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 main the main rule is is that um, you can't have dis disarticulated sets of human remains. So you can't have a leg of someone, and you can't have the skull of that person. The main thing is they've got to be together, because they are they do consist a body, um, and we do have that sense of respect for them. And, and taking away the humanity away from human remains, Kathy, is completely wrong. But we won't have a row about that. We will sometime or another. She will get me back for this one. Neolithic, so um, the results of the excavations. Neolithic um, struck flints and pottery, antler tools, stone hammers, of, um, and you've got a settlement or something before uh, the mound is there. You've got this superimposed sense of the burials there. Um, and they're also saying that um, it's good that they did excavate it because the, the badgers were starting to get into the Anglo-Saxon graves. Because... One thing about rodents, as on a Time Team episode, bringing Ellen into this one, as on a Time Team episode, did you remember seeing that Time Team episode? They, they had a kiss burial 
yeah. know, on the Scottish island, you can show up. They had a kiss burial on the Scottish island, right? Mm. And they thought, wow, what we're going to do in this kiss burial, right? We're, we're going we're gonna to lift the lid, right? We're going to have a perfectly preserved body in there, right? And as they lifted the lid, they had uh, the cranium, right? Upside down, and it was being used as a nest for... Uh -huh. Bingo, we put the rats in there, bingo, I got the rats in there, excellent. Mm. And they were so disappointed because everything else had been gnawed away. Mm. Um, oh, and the plastic, yeah. Yeah, the plastic was found in there, yes. Yes, it was it, bits of plastic and stuff and all the rest of it had been used in a little bit of a nest, yeah. Yeah, the rats, rats had brought her in. They'd, they'd done a bit of shopping at Tesco's. They decided to do a bit of recycling and they chucked it in there. Oh. So damage was also evident to many of the Anglo-Saxon graves, so this was a bit of a shame, but obviously the metal stuff and all the jewellery was very intact. The innovative, the innovative Barrow Clump project has achieved national recognition and been nominated for several awards and was the subject of a Time Team programme on Channel 4, which happens to be after one of my videos, of course, happens to be one of the most viewed archaeological programs on the internet. Ever. 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 <laughs> Ever. Its success has provided a template for a series of similar projects, which has continued since, involving the Ministry of Defence, Operation Nightingale, and Wessex Archaeology in the Third Reich. Any questions? I follow online Waterloo Uncovered, which is Tony Pollard, the archaeologist. He's still doing it, is he? Because he had a bit of a breakup with Neil Oliver, didn't he? Yeah. A bit of a yeah, lover's yeah, twist. He's still doing twist. it. They do a report every three months or so. Oh, that's, that's great. Worth. Online Waterloo Uncovered, it's called. Waterloo Uncovered. Oh. Yeah, they were doing an area up near where the hospital was in Waterloo, and they found bits of limbs and things like that which had been amputated and mm. all sorts. So the, uh, that that sounds absolutely... So, to, so Tony Pollard... Waterloo Uncovered. Uh, Waterloo Uncovered. Are there and any other questions? Uh, you know, ex-military uh, people trauma. Oh wow, time. that is sexy. We'll be including that, but I'll, I'll have a look at that. That's great. Um, are there any questions before we have a break? I just want to make a couple of announcements. Um, no. Oh, well, anyone who wants anyone who wants um, details of the um, well, there's a membership form in there. If, if anyway, so anyone who actually wants details of. Um, the Devon Cornwall trip. I've got sheets here because we gave them out the other day. Anyone need one of those sheets about the Devon and Cornwall trip? I know you've got no, Nobody wants to know if you've got one. I've asked if you want one. Just because you haven't been heard much today, okay? Doesn't mean to say off the button. Does anyone else want one of these sheets? No, I can't make it. No, okay, good. You can't make it? No. Okay, we're cancelling this. Go on, finish. <laughs> Anyone who wants to pay it, well, obviously, anyone's got any monies for that, that'd be great because we, we've paid for everything on it. Um, and anyone interested in my wonderful Monk Nash, our most haunted evening tomorrow night, Ooh. starting at 10 o'clock, let me know. Um, Have you seen how bad the weather's going to be for tomorrow? Well, we're still doing it. Oh. It's, in Monk Nash, it's in Monk Nash Wood, and it's, it's going to be quite nicely yeah. sheltered. Atmos <laughs> atmospheric. Just like, um, the rain, <laughs> You're gonna be skinned. You know how narrow the toilets are. Any questions? If there's no more questions, we'll take a break. Thank you very much. The kettle on. Time heals. Digging Kaya went with Operation Nightingale. So at first glance, the skills of a soldier and an archaeologist do not seem an obvious match. Yet both disciplines demand manual labour whatever the weather, and a keen appreciation of landscapes. Um, Sergeant Dermot Walsh explains how these military skills are deployed, being deployed on a Ministry of Defence site at Kaya Went. So we've looked at this one site in England. Um, and excavations, so the, the one thing about this excavation, it, it, forget it, okay, does it not mean to say this in this way, forget about the veterans, forget about rehabilitation um, for a moment. The one thing, of, one thing about this is, is that Dermot, um, he is a rather good archaeologist, and uh, even though I can't stand him, um, Dermot, Dermot, um, Dermot thought that the spoil um, that was at this site overlooking the Roman city at Kiawent uh, indicated was indicative of a substantial set of Roman remains because there were bits of mosaic there and all the rest of it. But when the National Museum of Vi Wales visited the site in 1913, there was very little of the site left to find. And Dermot thought, this is a bit strange. Um, 
and he started looking and uh, it turns out that the remains were actually under the spoil heaps <coughs> that the antiquarians put there. The antiquarians had been working in the wrong place for, before they even started. So wherever the antiquarians reported weren't substantial remains anyway, uh, they were surmising. Um, so when the museum went back there in 1913, there was nothing there naturally because they were hidden. Um, so what we're looking at here, we're looking at an area of an archaeologist, um, a guy from the Ministry of Defence, in amongst these pili, which are very similar to the ones which you can see at one of the bathhouses at Kaiwan itself. And you've got a nice section of wall there, up to a metre in height, about four or five courses, very similar to the wall that I was excavating at the car park uh, in the 1990s. This is a site known as White Wall Break, uh, and it's a, a Roman villa, a, a, an established important Roman villa site. Maybe I'm using the wrong word for it, but the site itself overlooks Kaiwend, and it's, it's in that sense uh, of landscape that Kaiwend city is not alone within that landscape. It's surrounded by a cornucopia of sets of archaeological remains. Going back to the disability side of things, what does archaeology mean to you? That's not an open question. We all have our own answers to this question. This is Dermot speaking now. Be it a curiosity about, about life in the past or a desire to better understand the present. For some, though, archaeology is far more than a rewarding interest. Servicemen wounded during active service in Afghanistan are discovering that archaeology offers a way to readjust to everyday life. We mentioned the importance of finding and having respect for human remains and um, Operation Nightingale. Um, apparently, um, in, in a nod to one of the most famous figures in British military med medicine, um, a, a certain Dr Nightingale, draws on the overlap between the skills of a soldier and those of an archaeologist. This realisation can be initially um, surprising to many engaged in the painstaking recovery of the past, but the, the same t tasks that they find relaxing or even mundane in the field can be a better uh, be a matter of life and death in an operational theatre. So what we're saying is the meticulous meticulousness of finding those details within the archaeology um, is is the same meticulousness seen in a military combat soldier. So this this is the base. Uh, um, this is the military base at Kaiwen, the MOD base at Kaiwen, which is still going. Uh, the city is down here, the road above um, Kaiwen, and within those trees, a um, ro rocky outcrop um, is actually this Roman site. And so, um, what was that? Is it an arms dump at Kaiwen? That rings a bell. I think there's an arms dump as well there. Yeah, the, yeah there is an arms dump, yeah. Used for, used, um, I think it used to be used by the heritage. Um, the Herifold Department of the Armed Forces, i.e. the SOS. The SAS, I got all that wrong. <laughs> the <laughs> SOS. <laughs> but again, you, the, the arms dump there is obviously um, frequented by, <coughs> by those soldiers based at Hereford known as the SAS. Um, there is our site there. There it is, the Roman city, just off the 848. Um, and just there, just above it, um, is this wonderful um, set of Roman remains. Also, time team worked at the site as well. But if I can remember in their episode, they didn't find the remains. So what I'd like to do... Oh, look at that image there. I'll put this on for Alan because he gets really excited about looking at hypercore systems. He goes home looking at images of hypercore systems, don't you, Alan? Oh, yeah. He's really into it big time. Um, field walking. So when, when you look at this site, it's actually <coughs> the clues with on the surface. We've mentioned moles, mole hills. We've mentioned badgers and, and badger sets. We've mentioned rats and so on. Um... It's, it's that sense of engaging with, with what you can readily find without even archaeology excavating. Um, and all this itself, looking for these little gems on the surface, help you understand the archaeology. This is how um, Rifleman uh, Sergeant Dermot Welsh of the 1st Battalion, uh, working alongside Richard Osgood, was actually starting to find these sites. It, and it was after a conversation, actually. Um, Sergeant Welsh who's a bit bolshy, um, and Richard, who's a very calm and gentle character, got involved um, in a conversation, and both of them said, look, you've got, um, 
Dermot said to Richard, he said, you've got all this archaeology on Ministry of Defence land, which I train on on a regular basis. Um, you're the Ministry of Defence archaeologist. Um, I've got combat veterans who are traumatised. Can we use the archaeology um, to aid in their recovery um, as a recovery activity? And lo and behold, this was seen to be something that the archaeology could be made very useful. Um, so... We've got a bit of an article. Um, this is um, this is an article um, of the week uh, from two thousand and fourteen. Archaeologists find Roman underfloor heating uh, buildings and a mosaic South Wales dig, um, and this is that image. So what you can see, they we worked on one bit of the wall, hypercore system, and this no longer existed because they were looking in the wrong place. And it's usually to do with plans. I don't know. Um, Again, quoting Time Team again, there was a chap on it called um, um, Guy de la Bidoyer, Um and I used to be in touch with him years ago. He used to be in Time Team, and, um, and now he's a history teacher at North. And when Guy de la Bidoyer, who was a Roman um, expert, he sat down at the end of a Time Team episode, um, and he was a bit peed off, um, genuinely peed off. And he said, I'm, I'm listening to all these people who are doing geophysics, right? But in a hundred years' time, those satellites that, that geophysics um, mapping stuff is com coming from won't be up there anymore. So all the records that we're using now to plot things will be obsolete. Uh, there's nothing wrong with, a, with um, a tape measure and somebody doing decent surveys. Why aren't we doing this? There's a question he was asking on Time Team. Um, and this is a question that's always been answered. When people plan something for example there's an oak tree over there there's a wall here that wall is approximately okay five meters from the oak tree right so you, you do this plan the oak tree is felled so when you're trying to find this wall in future generations you can't find it so it's always that problem with surveying um and that was the problem with this site and Dermot <coughs> actually um found this site. So we've got an underfloor heating system very similar to the stuff that they're finding at Kaya Went. And the wonderful coloured bits of mosaic that they were finding in the spoiler heap as well indicated something very, very important indeed. So it's the spotlight um, on Kaya Went um, was due to the fact that a few years earlier they'd actually found other remains within that vicinity. And the fresh interpretations that we find with the excavations at this site that overlooks Kaya Went um, is that there was a bit more of an urban fabric. Not everybody lived within the walls of Kaya Went, which still today stand up to five or six metres in height. The White Well Break Roman Complex lies a short distance from the walls of Kaya Went and um, it it's overlooks it. And what they felt as well, they felt that they needed to excavate it as, as, as well because metal detect enthusiasts may actually find these bits um, um, of artifacts on the surface in the spoil. They might find bits of mosaics. Amazing enough, metal detect enthusiasts breaking through the, um, the barb uh, wire fencing onto Ministry of Defence land metal detecting when it's an arms dump as well which is a really stupid thing to be doing. However, they do have metal detecting enthusiasts up there. So Dermot said, why are they metal detecting here, right? Why are they metal detecting on this site when there's no archaeology there? Is there something that they're not telling us? There was something that they weren't telling Dermot because the Roman villa was actually still there to be found. And this is what they're, um, this is what they're finding. A site with uh, the building walls of um, over 10 metres in length, uh, much, much bigger um, than anything they had suspected. Here's a bit of a ground plan to show you some of the problems. Again, lots of these lectures over the past few months have been given inherent problems and problem solving. And the last week's lecture will sort of um, be, be, um, be the combination of all these lectures that we've been doing, really. Um, so what they've been doing, what, what they found is here, where some of the walls that have been excavating, Dermot's excavations, uh, the, the antiquarians have been excavating here, thinking that there was something here, when there wasn't really much substantial here, and all the spoil heaps were dumped in this area. Uh, so when the museum went there in 1913, excavating in here, there was nothing. 
Except Dermot was saying, here, in the spoil heaps, there's bits of mosaic, so where are these coming from? And the metal detecting enthusiasts were making the same determination. And that walls which were um, 10 metres in length, but walls maybe up to 100 metres in length, east to west, so this was a substantial site. Bits of a hypercourse system here, walls probably running all the way along here as well, part of this wall section as well, all this alongside the hollow way, which would lead all the way to the Roman city. Um, and this is all, all these, all these gems, even when people say there's nothing there anymore, there sometimes is. X does sometimes mark the spot. So, what we're going to do, we're going to show you one, a couple more images, um, and then, here we go. There we go. And these are the bits of walls that they're finding. Bits of the walls that were said no longer exist. Um, and they actually found out that there's um, a, a technique that they found out that the Romans were using. Um, the, because this is on a hill, a knoll, overlooking Kaiawent, obviously this wall is going to be prone to subsidence, naturally. Um, and the Romans found that there were problems with subsidence. Uh, good quality building stone. Excavations revealed that the mortar foundations had failed at the centre here. So instead of rebuilding the wall, they just got somebody with a mixture in, dumped a load of mortar on there, job done, answered the problem, and you could build a wall up from it. A lazy way of building, but the Romans took shortcuts like people do today. I've got, I got a few, I've got, um, what I'm going to do is that then they started to find out that obviously this site continues in comparison alongside uh, the wonderful um, Kaya Went itself. Um, and they're having to use various bits of equipment, geophysics, to look in amongst the trees and obviously finding things from the Second World War as well. And some of the, some of the detection equipment that they were finding from the Second World War was very interesting and intriguing. Um, and that equipment led them to find um, a disused Second World War shelter in amongst the Roman remains, interesting enough. Uh, and what, what they found, they, they found out that um, they, they, needed to, they needed to be working here um, within this landscape um, because damage had been caused to the archaeology um, just before the Second World War. They'd found an old um, shelter that may have been used for armaments um, at the time of the Second World War along this site. And in, something else that would interest the likes of Alan and the likes of Peter, Roman coins. Um, whilst this is what was drawing metal detect enthusiasts to the site, these coins. Um, usually when metal detect enthusiasts um, don't have permission to be on a site, they're going to be finding their things and quickly getting off site so nobody sees them. And I'm sure the Ministry of Defence wouldn't want people metal detecting. And they found 24 of these coins in the archaeological excavations as well. And finding 24 coins in the archaeological excavations was why the metal detect enthusiasts were there in the first place. Because there were obviously many more of these at one stage. Um, only a few more minutes to go. Does it say which emperor? Um, they th this, this, is, this is a coin from Emperor, Le um, um, Emperor Carausius. Um, I've actually got one of these coins. I could tell because Emperor Carausius didn't have... His neck didn't come in. It was like... <coughs> so this is Emperor Carausius. This is known as a radiate crown coin from approximately the 290s. Good question. I can precisely answer that one. Um, so I've, I've actually got one of these. And, I, and, and they, again, finding this... Um, means that they've got to continue working on the site to try and get all the evidence. And obviously, when you're saying you're finding coins on site, it's going to drag more people in, which is a bit of a shame. So, what I'm going to do next is show you another image of the camaraderie that's involved with this site. So, hang on, covered most of that wrong. 
that's the last bit. Uh, oh, there we go, there's the gang. And if I can zoom in on this one, Operation Nightingale at Kyle went. Um, I know it's a very fuzzy image, but spot where Phil Harding is. <laughs> which, which one's Phil Harding? Yeah. <laughs> there he is. He, he doesn't actually change his clothes. Um, so, again, you, you've, got, you've got big figures involved in this, and, it, and it's really useful. So you've got the hypercore systems, everything else found at the site. So that's, that's, that's what we're talking about. This is the importance of the likes of um, Operation um, Nightingale, with places like Salisbury um, and the site that we've looked at in Kaya Went. I just want to mention just one other thing, one other silly little thing that you might... They're actually looking at modern archaeology as well. And one thing that's missing, and I'm sure this would probably interest you, Andrew, because it's a military thing, Operation Nightingale, military veterans to search for remains of the Band of Brothers units. Uh, Band of Brothers huts, uh, they, where their unit was actually based. This is dated 16th of April. Operation Nightingale has been working on um, modern archaeology. Uh, that's the symbol, a trowel. Um, and this, this, this is <coughs> the serpent, it's here associated with um, the Hippocratic Oath. Um, so that's the caring thing. So Operation Nightingale, I can give you an update on this. They, they worked at a site at Alborough. Um, and what they wanted to do, the Second World War was a time when records were not kept of anything. Um, and actually, I've actually seen the image of the building, which I haven't got for you today, because that's going to be in my one of the closing lectures about all these things. Um, so if I keep that there, just a few more minutes and we'll call it day, everyone. Where's my little cursor? Keep that there. Yeah, you can move that. Um, so they, they've actually located where the Band of Brothers actually were, were billeted. Uh, e Company, the ones that were placed in on the, 16th, uh, on the 6th of June 1944 to assist the Allied advance on Utah Beach. They've actually found the building. They found the artifacts. Um, so Operation Nightingale has been surveying extensively. And Richard Omgrook said, once we leave, you'll never know uh, we were there. And the archaeology that they, that they found is intriguing. They found the exact building that buildings these troops were actually uh, based in. And when I conclude these lectures in a few weeks' time, we'll actually visit that. And on that note, that's a good place to finish. This is Operation Nightingale. Um, are there any questions? Have you all enjoyed that today, folks? Yeah, thank you. Before. Good, good, good. We've covered a bit of everything. Anglo-Saxon, Roman. Yeah. Don't forget, Ellen. Um, you'll be back. I need to see you, Jim. Any questions? No questions? One? He's not, he's not a professor, but he works for Wessex Archaeology and he's highly skilled. He's not, that, that's, that's, uh, that's the other club. Yeah. That's Phil, that's Aston, the one who died. Anyway, have a chat about that in a minute. Well, Julian Richard said to me that when he was in his class, he never once said who are. Where's Julian Richards? Because there's two. Yeah, I, right, if there's no more questions, thanks very much, folks. Yeah.